Well, thanks for coming out today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Mary Jo implied, much of the interest in my lab has focused on how insects survive adverse times, like winter. How, how do the, what kinds of adaptations do they make to survive in the winter? The, um, several years ago, we were sitting in the cafe over here by the library with my postdocs and graduate students, and we decided, if we're really serious about this, we should go to some place that's really tough. Uh, where there is a really an extreme environment and see how an insect survives there. We were aware uh, that there is an insect that lives in Antarctica. It's the only insect endemic to that continent. It was found uh, by a, Briti uh, a Belgian uh, exploratory vessel called the Belgica that was plying the waters of Antarctica around 1911. There's a Romanian naturalist on board who found this insect, took it back to Belgium, gave it the name Belgica Antarctica. So we knew there was an insect that lived there. And I have a good colleague um, from Miami University, Rick Lee, who had actually worked on this, been down to Antarctica about 30 years ago, had worked on this insect and sort of described that it was a really an extreme, uh, can survive all sorts of extreme adaptations. But no one had looked at it for a long time. And we decided that uh, we should, now that the new tools that were available, we could probably ask a lot more neat questions about this insect. So I had never actually applied, uh, uh, written a grant for an insect I'd never seen before, but the National uh, Science Foundation has a polar program that supports research in, in uh, the poles. So we decided to write a grant to see if we could get money to go down to look at this insect. My biggest fear was actually that Maybe we'd get there and find that the insect was no longer there. But fortunately, that was not the case. It, it was still uh, where we were expecting to find it. The, um, just to give you some perspective, Antarctica, you, it's a little hard to know from the maps in the bottom of the globe uh, what the size is. But this is, uh, puts it in perspective with continental United States. The, um, and I realize I'm looking out here some faces who know Antarctica much better than I do. I have been there. Uh, we've been uh, working on this midge for about 12 years or so. I personally have gone about five times, uh, but people from my lab have gone um, other times when I haven't been down myself. But this is, yeah, the continent of south of um, Antarctica is an interesting, an interesting place. You know, around... Well, Argentina and Chile still think they own the place, but in 1959, the, the countries of the world uh, signed the Antarctic Agreement during the Eisenhower era, uh, stating that Antarctica belongs to no one. It, uh, it belongs to all people, and the only things that can happen there are things that are uh, of no economic, that cannot be used, exploited economically. There can be no military efforts in Antarctica. And all that happens there should be for peaceful ends and for the good of humankind. So th this is my kind of a continent. I, I like Antarctica a lot. It has a lot, a lot going for it. Now, the US has stations, uh, three stations, Palmer Station, where I've been, South Pole and McMurdo. People like David Elliott and others have spent their time down here in McMurdo and, and uh, um, uh, South Pole. But our effort has focused up here in, um, in Palmer Station. Now, McMurdo and South Pole are much larger stations than Palmer. And to get there, you uh, fly first to Christ Church in New Zealand and then go across. And there's la the landing strips where you can uh, arrive there. Now, Palmer's a much smaller station, so we, we don't have an airstrip at Palmer Station. So we go down to Punta Arenas, Chile, and get on the, um, the icebreaker, the Lawrence Gould, to make our way across. Now, NSF uh, supplies us with uh, extreme weather gear there that they keep at Punta Arenas, so we get supplied with our uh, cold temperature equipment. And also, we have to be very careful to get all the supplies we need well in advance of the trip. I mean, here we're used to, you know, we need something, we'll order it the next day and we'll have it. But there's not that kind of service in Antarctica, so we have to uh, make sure that all the supplies we need, all the uh, material and the equipment that we need is there about six months in advance um, uh, so that it's there in time for the ship to go. In fact, the first year we went down, 
uh, we discovered that uh, they were missing some triazole, which is a very important a chemical age reagent that we needed for our first step in our, some of our molecular work. Well, they flew a plane back to Santiago, got us a bottle of Trizol and blew it back. So, I mean, it had to be the most expensive bottle of Trizol on the face of the earth by the time it arrived, but we couldn't have done anything without it. So, been really impressed with the kind of infrastructure that has been provided by uh, uh, support in support of our efforts. So, today we take off from um, uh, Punta Arenas, go through the Straits of Magellan and down across the tip of the South uh, South America. This is our first year down. I'm here with a couple of my postdocs at that time. Joe Reinhardt, who now works for USDA in Fargo, and Scott Hayward, who's at the um, University of Birmingham in, in the UK. So it's about a four or five day journey from Punta Arenas to uh, Palmer Station. And by this time we are uh, here along the Antarctic um, continent. Um, this icebreaker goes rather slowly. It has a bow that, a bow that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, rocks quite a bit. And if you know anything about the Drake Passage, that passage of water between the tip of South America and the tip of Antarctica, it's really rough water. The water, there's nothing to break the current around there, so the waves just whip around there. And 20-foot uh, waves are sort of routine. 30 to 40-foot waves are not at all unusual. And there's a, and, but sometimes you go through easily and you know, no problem at all, easy trail. But um, we've had a number of, of rough passages, some that weren't so great. But in these rough passages, you just, you sort of wonder why you're doing this. And uh, you know, suitcases flying all over the place, you sort of strap yourself into your bunk and, and the cook does, isn't very busy for about a day and a half in there while you're doing, while you're in that passage. But once you get there and the calmness of the Antarctic, it's very, very attractive. Now the, um, so the missing slide here is one that is, I didn't have my camera out during the passage, but this was captured by, in a, a painting by uh, John, uh, Carmi uh, John um, uh, Carmichael Wilson, Wilson Carmichael, who, uh, captured the scene of, of going through the Drake Passage. Um, you know, even if you read some of those old sailing accounts of the early vessels going around the tip of South America, you know, it's really some incredible voyages. And Darwin was ill the whole time, from the time he hit the tip of South America until he got to the Galapagos from the rough, rough waters that prevail in that, in that environment. So here we are, this is Palmer Station, a very small station as you can see, just a small and much, much smaller than the other two stations that the U.S. operates. Um, and here it is a little bit closer up. This is the boathouse, these are the Zodiacs that we do a lot of our uh, traveling in, and this is the main lab building. You sleep up here, you go down a flight of stairs, have your breakfast, go down another flight of stairs and to the lab. Much nicer than my drive in this morning in 315 and all that chaos. This is a nice, uh, a nice easy commute and uh, a, fun, a fun place to work. There are about, the station can accommodate about 45 people, but of those, most of the people are support staff who are keeping the station going. There are only about 15 uh, scientists who can be there at, the time, at one time. And the scientists are only, are, at Palmer, are restricted to the summer months. So that means you know, December, January, February, uh, basically. Um, and the, the, so the, with, we're going with a group of five most times, so we've had a, we represented about um, a third of the station's uh, occupants when we were there. Other people uh, were studying you know, birds and uh, whales and, other, and plankton and other organisms that are abundant in that area. Inside the lab, you know, the labs are very nicely equipped. They do a great job of keeping us supplied. It wasn't great for the sort of molecular experiments that, that my lab does, but we can at least do the prep work and then bring samples back to do the more uh, sophisticated work that we needed to do uh, back home. But you know, really a good, good facilities that they maintain and maintain them very well. But this is why I went, to study the largest land animal in Antarctica that lives in Antarctica year round. Well, sure, there are things like seals and penguins that are up on the land, but they're just there for a couple months uh, uh, during the breeding season. This is, this is the biggest guy who lives there year round. Now, this little, this is the, the larva of the midge. This is a full, uh, the, the full grown larva it, uh, before it has turned into an adult. Um, 
It lives encased in ice most of the year. And, and it, when it thaws out in, in, in the summer, late December or so, it has about a month and a half, two months in which it can feed. And it feeds on algae and bacteria that are uh, present in that area. And then the winter comes again and freezes over, waits for another year. It takes it two years to get through its uh, uh, life cycle uh, in this environment. And this, this is what the adults look like. This is a mating pair, female here and a male. You can see it's wingless. In fact, most uh, insects that live in windy islands, windy environments like that lose their wings because if you had wings, come airborne and you'd be carted off to sea and uh, never to make it again. So uh, as most uh, insects in windy areas, it is, is a wingless uh, insect. The adults don't even feed. They simply emerge, mate, lay eggs, and they die within a week or 10 days. So it's a very short-lived uh, life cycle uh, that they have. And okay, this is a map of the Palmer Station. This is Palmer Station right here. But you'll see there are a whole bunch of islands out here. And in fact, this is where we had to go to find the midges. The midges really were not there at Palmer Station itself. So we, we needed to go out to, this, um, to these islands to get the midges. And this blue line indicates the boating limit. We, we had a five mile limit that we were uh, restricted to in our, in our um, visits. So here we go. This is with one of my uh, Graduate students, Nick Teets at the time, he's now a professor at uh, University of Kentucky. So we go out from Palmer Station in these Zodiacs, and you know, we, we have to learn how to operate these Zodiacs. I didn't know much about those things before, a land lover like I am, uh, but we learn how to do those, and they give us all kinds of good safety tips, and you know, what if we go overboard? We have to learn how to rescue people, and they tell us to, if you go overboard, put your hands like this so they freeze in that position so they can pull you up. So yeah, you might want to remember that should you find yourself in those streets at some point. So, and here we are at one of the, uh, one of the islands. We keep in, in close radio contact with the station because the weather can change very rapidly down there from uh, looking like this to being very clear and then being all covered in again. They do uh, keep caches of uh, uh, emergency equipment on the island, so if we do get uh, stuck on an island, we know, uh, you know we could you know, probably survive until they could get us again. But this is, uh, this is be the common habitat for the midge that we look at. This is Joe Reinhardt, again, one of my former postdocs. See this green stuff here? This is an algae called Presciola crispa. They like to eat that. They like to, uh, we usually find them kind of close to the penguin rookeries. That bacterial runoff from the, ba from the penguin rookeries is a very important source of food for them. So if we usually find a penguin rookery and find some of this green algae, we, we know we're pretty close to, uh, you know, very likely to find the midges. But the populations of the midges are very, um, they're locally abundant, but very patchy. They're here and there, and frankly, we're, we feel lucky that they're at the, uh, at the uh, uh, Palmer Station site, 60 miles away, the, the British have a station. They're not there, and frankly, if they had been at the British station, we wouldn't have had anything to do because the Brits had sent a lot of people down and would have <clears throat> done all the experiments that we did, uh, but we, we were lucky they were here. But this is the environment that, uh, that we find them in. <clears throat> and just a comment here, I mean, we're not supposed to get real close to the penguins and the elephant seals but they don't get that message. They come, we're working there and they'll come over, waddle over and uh, check us out and look at us. And it's, um, it's much like, some of you have been to the Galapagos, I'm sure, it's much like that kind of environment where the animals are not at all afraid of the humans and they will, they're very curious and, and come, to, uh, come to check us out. Uh, the last couple years, we have sent some of our people down a little earlier and kept them a little bit later. Uh, at that point, the, the midges are still encased in the ice, so it's a little, little harder to get the midges out <laughs> under those conditions, but uh, that's why we have graduate students and people like Ben who uh, were down and <laughs> were able to chip them out. Uh, okay. Um, this, I'm, I'm here with a, a teacher, Luke Sandro. Each year, uh, we took a teacher with us. Uh, the first year, uh, Ms. Luke Sandro, a middle school uh, teacher from the Dayton area. We've taken a high school teacher, elementary teacher, and some other people in, in education. NSF, as you know, is, is very, um, <clears throat> likes, stresses outreach quite a bit. 
So that was, that was checking that box for us. Uh, and the teachers did a great job you know, writing <clears throat> blogs and being in contact with the schools here in Ohio and around the country and indeed around the world, following what we were doing and writing interesting accounts of, of life in Antarctica and what, what was happening. But we also trained them to uh, be part of the scientific uh, crew as well. So Luke gave, gave Luke some uh, sessions in the summer before we left, uh, learned how to use the osmometer, and so he was able to fully participate in some of the scientific um, experiments as well. So that was a very important part of, of what we did and what we, the goals we set out to accomplish. So yeah, just some wonderful scenes, lots of bergs. Uh, you really can't take too many pictures of icebergs. This is calving of the glacier behind us, so, you know, loud sounds, sort of sounds like thunder. And I thought, first time I heard it, I thought, oh, thunderstorm coming up, and now uh, it was, that's what it was. And this, I have a series of pictures just to show the environment. A lot of lichens on some of the islands. Other islands were, uh, you know, fairly different. Again, lichens over this one. Uh, some very interesting rock formations in some of the islands. Each one being a little different. Now behind the station, there's a glacier. We can climb up to the top of that, but there was a limit because there were some crevasses. It, it looked. It looks so welcome, you'd love to just take it off and walk for a long distance, but you really aren't, can't do that for good reasons because there are crevasses that you could fall into and probably wouldn't make it back again. Um, we get visitors when we're down there. This is a French sailing ship that came to visit us when we were there. Um, you can, if you happen to be in the area, uh, don't hesitate to stop by. You can come into the station get some coffee and brownies, and we'll tell you what we're doing. And you can stop at a gift shop and buy a t-shirt. So what's not to like about that? <laughs> so uh, um, we had a lot of visitors. And you know, some of these big ships that come down, like the Volendam, that you know, have thousands of people, people in these ships cannot get off the, the ship. But NSF likes for us to go out and talk to these people. So we go out in our zodiacs, you know, sometimes a couple, several miles out to see to where these big ships can come in. And frankly, I think that was the scariest thing I've done during my times in the Antarctica. They throw a rope over this, rope ladder, and we gotta catch the swell at the right time to get on the ladder and go up to, uh, to talk to these people in, the, uh, in their theaters. But, you know, we have, uh, take advantage of their nice buffets and, uh, after you've been down there for a couple of months, you sort of run out of the fresh veg fruits and vegetables and they always send uh, freshies back to station with us and some cheesecake. So it makes the trip worthwhile and uh, helps us to also check that box of outreach. There are some other, in addition to the midge, there are some other close insect relatives that are there. This is a, the seabird, Ixodes uriae. This is a, a, I find a very interesting a tick. We've done a little bit of work with this tick too. It's a, a tick that has a bipolar distribution. It's down in Antarctica. It's also up in the Arctic, but nowhere in between. And I, I still don't quite understand how it could have gotten from one pole to the other, but it seems to have been a rather recent, there's no indication of, of different species. They are still the same, very clearly the same species. Uh, usually they don't stay on the birds very long. They come take a blood meal and leave, but there must have been a few individuals that caught a ride from one of those uh, birds that go from one pole to the other, some of the terns, or perhaps some of the skuas, or some other birds that are, also, that are known to be uh, bipolar. So that's kind of a neat uh, tick. It goes in, crawls under these rocks, and then waits for the birds to come, uh, come in the next, uh, next year and uh, feeds on them once again. This is an also a little, a little mite, uh, sort of the size of a pinhead that uh, lives down there. We've done some work with this species as well. And there's some columbula. These are uh, little called springtails or close relatives to insects, very, very small things that can be enormously abundant there. And we've, we've uh, since we were there, we took advantage in, of them as well and have done some experiments with them as well. The larger animals, the elephant seals, uh, all over the place, and yeah, come up to check us out at the lab sometimes. And again, we just let them, okay, you, sometimes they hang out for a day or so there, and we use other doors to get in and out. And uh, uh, very uh, curious place. Now this, this is a leopard seal, the top predator down there. And of course, they come in around the time we 
um, at the end of our season, around the time when the penguin uh, fledglings are about ready to take off and go into the water, the elephants, uh, the uh, um, elephants, or the uh, um, sh the uh, shoot, what are they? Uh, leopard seals. Yeah, my goodness, uh, losing it. The leopard seals come in to feast on these uh, uh, young penguins. Of course, we're out there in these zodiacs, or air-filled zodiacs. And I've seen what a leopard seal can do to one of those zodiacs. But fortunately, they have four separate canisters, so if you do get one bite, you can still make it back to a station. But anyway, they sometimes come up on one side, look at you, disappear, and then come up on the other side. And it's uh, we usually keep an oar close by to bat them off if they're there. So in spite of that smile that looks rather attractive, uh, you know, we, do, we do give them wide berth. And in fact, a, a few years ago, there was a British graduate student who was uh, killed by a leopard seal at the British station not too far away. So they, you certainly need to give them the respect they need. At the end of the season, the fur seals start to come in. And there are a lot of good uh, whales in the area, a lot of humpbacks especially. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, they'll come right up by the zodiac and look at you eyeball to eyeball. And uh, this is a little too close. I mean, that's a couple uh, a graduate student and one of Rick's graduate students in the back there. Uh, that's a little too close for comfort, if you can imagine the size of the whale, could, what it could do to a zodiac. You might have to do your rescue uh, pretty dramatically. But at any rate, they come through, and uh, some orcas occasionally come through, although they're not nearly as abundant as the humpbacks. A group from Duke who's been down there uh, this, with the crossbow is taking plug samples from the humpbacks and uh, collecting uh, tissue samples to analyze to uh, assay the um, condition of the whales. The dominant penguin uh, down there are the Udellis, uh, cute little guys, look like they're wearing tuxedos. Uh, here's a Udelli penguin colony that we did a lot of work next to. And you can see these gray furry blobs, so they're young. And here's one late in the season, I mean, the, the adults sit in the eggs early on, and the chicks, and the little chicks, but even when the chicks become really big like that, they sit in their heads. I don't quite get it. It's kind of an interesting behavior, I guess. <laughs> well, anyway, I don't, I don't know what, what that's all about, but at any rate, uh, that's what they do. And really, uh, really interesting penguins. In more recent years, there, we're seeing more of these chinstrap uh, penguins. They're more of a warmer climate penguin. As places are warming up a bit, uh, more of the chin straps are coming in. Also the Gen 2s. Here's a Gen 2, again, you think of it as more of a warm climate penguin. These are sheath bills, they sort of look like chickens that are uh, down there. And this is a skua. Um, I'm a big bird fan, big bird watcher, but I do not like skuas. They, you know, if Hitchcock were being realistic in his movie, The Birds, he would have used skuas instead of seagulls because these things do attack you. They come right after you. You sort of have to wear a, a helmet in order to keep the skuas off your head. They, if they're defending the nest, they, they are a very, very nasty bird and uh, not, not a big fan of skuas. Uh, giant petrels, these are you know, big birds with six foot wingspans that go up and down the coast of Africa during their uh, non-breeding season, but they come back to these same nesting sites there by Palmer Station during the, uh, the breeding season. And the Frasers, uh, Donna and, and Bill, have uh, worked on these uh, seabirds for over 25 years and developed their relationship with these birds that they can go in and uh, reach your hand in and weigh the chicks without the adults uh, being uh, mining at all. So it's uh, been a long, some really neat long-term studies on these birds and some others. Uh, Antarctic tern and the cormorants. Okay, uh, what did, we, we did more than just look at the seals and the penguins and that sort of thing. <laughs> we had to do, fulfill the needs of our, uh, what we wrote in the grant proposal as well. Uh, this is just a segue into that. Well, we did have an ice machine down there, but my postdocs thought it was cooler to chill their samples in 10,000-year-old uh, sea ice instead of uh, that, but we, we usually didn't use the ice machine. So um, I, this picture of ice crystals is there just to remind me to tell you that the real problem with water and freezing in a living cell is that when an ice crystal forms, uh, the structure of the ice crystal will, can rupture the cell. So what do you do about 
uh, preventing ice formation from occurring inside the cell. So it's a major problem of any insect. Here, insects in our uh, temperate region too that need to get through the winter. How do you prevent ice formation from occurring? Well, one of the neat survival mechanisms these uh, midges use is simply to be able to dehydrate very, very well. Most insects around here can uh, survive dehydration of about 20 or maybe 30 percent of their water, but these guys can lose 70 percent of their water. They look like dried up little raisins. You can't imagine they're still alive, but you, you know, put some water on them, they plump up and go on their merry way. So they have found out a way to lose their water. In this case, we're showing uh, certainly survival against time at minus 10 degrees C. And you can see if they're fully hydrated, they don't survive very well at all. But in this case, desiccating and just losing 30% of their water, they survive uh, extremely well. So getting rid of the water is what, and being able to survive is a really important component of uh, what make, enables them to live there. Now, <clears throat> insects around here for the winter often make uh, things like antifreezes like glycerol or sugar like trellos often goes, rises in the body level to just like you put antifreeze in your car radiator in the winter to keep it from freezing. Many insects will add glycerol or some other polyol to their body to do that. Um, they do it to a little, to a limited extent. There's elevation of glycerol and elevation of trellos, but that's much less impressive than it even is in, in insects living here in the temperate region. So that, that is a minor uh, response that is occurring, but it's not, it's not a big thing for them. <clears throat> now, heat shock proteins <clears throat> seem to be really important here. Heat shock proteins, as the name implies, are proteins that were actually first described because um, <clears throat> in response to heat stress, these proteins come on and provides protection. These are the very same proteins that your own body makes when you have a fever. And the, when you look at the, uh, the structure of these heat shock proteins, <clears throat> you can look at a sequence of a heat shock protein in your own body, look at the fly, and uh, they're nearly identical. Well, a number of years ago, we found that insects around here in the wintertime are making these heat shock proteins. And we wanted to ask if that was true in Antarctica as well. Well, <clears throat> just a little bit more on these heat shock proteins. They have different names according to <clears throat> their molecular weight. Heat shock protein 70, means a molecular weight of 70, one at 90. There's an HSC 70 and a whole bunch of small ones uh, too. So not, <clears throat> not important for you, but just give you an idea of the different uh, ones that are there. Now in a protein in your body, <clears throat> as it's exposed to heat or cold, it may denature. Take it a bit further, you get a whole bunch of you know, aggregation of all these proteins uh, that occurs. And the role of the heat shock proteins is to interfere here either to prevent this from occurring, denaturation from occurring, or help to repair those proteins when they're there. Um, so we, uh, this is again, not something you really want to look at, but let me just walk you through this. These are adults and these are the larvae. Um, the small heat shock protein, you can see at four degrees it's not made in the adult. At 30 degrees it is made, then it turns off again at 35. This is sort of a classic heat shock response at high temperature. You can see the larvae are making this at four degrees and they're making it all the time. Similarly for these other heat shock proteins, they're just, they're turned on all the time, which is very unusual for a heat shock protein. You usually don't uh, um, make them all the time, but these it seems to be something that's a very important for these. And we can go in and knock down those heat shock proteins using RNA interference, which uh, renders the protein uh, unfunctional, uh, eliminates the gene essentially, so it's not able to make these. And when we do that, they lose their cold tolerance. So we know that the, these heat shock proteins are important for that response. Now in Antarctica, there's also the high uh, ultraviolet radiation. We looked at some of the antioxidant uh, responses. These are just some of the key genes that are involved in, in uh, uh, getting, eliminating some of the uh, agents, free oxygen radicals that can lead to stress and damage or do all kinds of cell damage. And indeed, when we look at some of these, cell, these genes that encode SOD or catalase, you can see that they are also turned on all the time. Um, <coughs> so it's, they're there, we think, doing a very important protective role against ultraviolet damage that is so intense in Antarctica. And this, as I described it early on, as a 
polyextremophile. It can stand all kinds of different extremes of uh, environmental conditions. And they can, among those, it can survive six days in seawater. Most insects, you put them in seawater, they'd be dead in a couple hours. But these guys are, are very happy, six days, no problem. Um, they do a number of adaptations they go through to during that time, but they amazing tolerance of really high salinity. And that's pretty important because the seawater rushes in over these islands in the habitat where the, the midge lives. So that's an important uh, thing to be able to survive in uh, both seawater and then when ice melts, which is essentially no water with no salt, they can live in both of those conditions and live there very well. Well, so far, you know, I talked about several different genes that we went after, the heat shock proteins and uh, some of these others that we looked at, but we really thought we'd like to have the global picture of, of what kinds of gene changes are occurring during this. And in order to do that, we needed to sequence the genome of this uh, little, in, of this insect. And this just uh, shows again the, that, okay, we did that, uh, and it's uh, the total assembled size we got here was around 89 megabases, again. But the interesting thing is this is the smallest known insect genome. We didn't set out to find the smallest insect genome, it just happened to be there. In fact, this is the first genome that we uh, sequenced and I figured, yeah, we just don't know what we're doing. We missed something here, but uh, we, you know, we verified it and using another technique of flow cytometry, an uh, independent mechanism, uh, again, estimated the size to be about 98 uh, megabases. So here's Belgica, and here are the wide range of other insect genomes, and at this point it still um, is the smallest genome that is uh, yet known. So what does this mean? I mean, midges are in a family called Chironomidae, and we now know that most of the Chironomids have a rather small genome, but not this small. So I think it's both a feature of it being a, one of the midges, and then maybe some aspect of, of that's associated with it being an extremophile. Um, it has a number of interesting attributes that I'm not going to mention much about, but essentially this is a uh, genome that's gotten rid of, of all the sort of junk, if you will. It has the same number of genes that most organisms have, around 14,000 or so, but it's gotten rid of all the excess, all the introns and repeat, repetitive elements and uh, transposons and things that, that clog up our genome and make it uh, so huge. So it's taken it down to the very, um, very basics. Now, what I, uh, but now that we have this genome, know every gene in its body, this enables us to go in and then look at the big patterns of what kinds of pathways are being turned on or turned off in response to desiccation or other stresses we might want to look at. You know, just, uh, so here we, we've taken our fourth instar larvae, exposed them to different humidity uh, conditions, and then look at gene expression using a technique known as RNA-seq. And from that, <clears throat> we can identify pathways that are important, some that are turned on and some that are turned off. Again, I don't expect you to be uh, terribly interested in what these specific genes are, but basically all the green ones there are ones that are being turned on. And you can see there are a whole bunch of in certain pathways that are associated with what we call autophagy. This is, uh, these are genes that are involved in restructuring uh, the body when you change from one form to another. They conserve the protein, whereas autogeny, or ap apoptosis, uh, I'm sorry, apoptosis is cell death. So genes associated with cell death are turned off and ones associated with uh, uh, autophagy are, are turned on. And another group ju showing just the opposite, genes that are turned off. These are ones that are involved in metabolism, glycolysis, the TCA cycle, ATP synthesis. You see the consistency of you, what you're able to do with this kind of information. Just find whole pathways that are turned on or turned off. It gives you a good idea of what, uh, what the big landscape is metabolically and at the molecular level what is, what is happening. Aquaporins, these are genes that uh, are channels in our cell membrane that water passes through. That's how water gets in and out of the cell. Well, we thought since dehydration is so important that aquaporins might be kind of important uh, uh, genes to look at too. So we, we uh, uh, went after the aquaporins. In fact, by our old methods, we, we were able to isolate one aquaporin, but now once we had the whole genome, we were able to uh, get the whole repertoire of uh, five other uh, aquaporin genes 
that were in that uh, in the Belgica body. And we're now in the process of looking through those specific genes and seeing which ones might be important, which ones are not. Just a typical example, this is one of the aquaporins called DRIP. And you can, you can see here, this is the gene being expressed and it's up in response to some of the dehydration responses that we've uh, given to it. Now, what the final set of experiments I want to talk about are about time measurement in the perception of time in Antarctica. Here you're in an environment where it's essentially light uh, in the summer around the clock and in the winter it's dark the whole time. Well, as you know, most insects, most organisms, us included, are very uh, structured in our, in our daily activities um, and things happen at certain times and we have sleep cycles and rest cycles. So we were interested in seeing how the presence or absence of light impacts these midges in this environment. But let me first just cycle you through what a day looks like in early January. This is 8 p.m. This is 10 p.m. This is 11 p.m. This is midnight. This is sunset. Okay, it goes down 1 a.m. Okay, you can see, okay, the sun's below the horizon, but you can still read a newspaper outside. You, you know, it's light enough for you to do most things. It's not all that different than it was a couple hours earlier. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., sunrise, okay. 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 a.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m. Okay, you get the idea. It doesn't change in some days at least. It'd really be hard to distinguish a day from a night. So what does this mean for, for insects and their clocks and, and how does that work? Now you probably, you've probably all heard something about, I mean, in, in clock uh, experiments are very, uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening in that field. Our own body has a number of uh, very important genes that di dictate what, um, what we do at certain times of the day. And, and just some of these very important ones are period gene and the timeless gene. Uh, and they have very regular periods of cycling during the day. These are the genes that are expressed and you're, when they're out of kilter when you're jet lag, when you travel to China someday and, and uh, you're messed up, your clock is messed up. It's because these genes are not cycling. They're out of phase, they're out of phase with the environment. So we went to see, so we cloned uh, the clock genes from Belgica uh, to see what they might be doing. And if we were looking at a typical animal from this part of the world, say under 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, these genes like period and timeless would have a big peak right here around the beginning of the dark phase. But you can see these, these genes are pretty flat out all the time, light and dark under those uh, conditions. And when we look at the animal, we, we put little cameras in these uh, little arenas and made these midges uh, uh, walk around or see what they wanted to do in different phases of the light. So this is under a period of three hours of dark and, and uh, 21 hours of light. And you can see our recordings. These guys are active all the time, light and dark. Here we went to complete darkness. They still kept on chugging away. You look at the, the genes of period and timeless during this time. No cycles. They, they have the genes, the genes are there for the clock, but they simply do not cycle. They just are on all the time. So that, um, it, it looks like they, uh, you know, there's such a narrow window of, for activity and they, they just are continuously active during that brief period. Okay, the ship comes back for us in uh, mid-February or so. Um, we <coughs> pack up our gear, we are able to uh, take, actually by that, that previous picture, by the time we leave in late February, there's a significant period of darkness and some absolutely gorgeous sunsets some, some days. But we pack up our uh, material, we've been able to extend our uh, experimental season quite a bit because we bring the midges back with us uh, and we can keep them in our laboratory at, in our cold room at four degrees. They're happy there, they do very well take them out to our laboratory at 25 degrees and they die within a few hours. But if you, as long as you keep them at four degrees of such a refrigerator temperature, uh, they do very well. And we, we bring them back, we brought them back say in late February and have been able to continue to use them until the following uh, December or January. Now we don't want to keep them 
We haven't been able to propagate them uh, continuously. We have not had much success with that. But if we were to do that, we'd have no excuse to go back again. So at any rate, that's, uh, uh, that's part of the game <laughs> we play. But uh, we, we actually have one of my Japanese colleagues is having some success in rearing them. So we may not have to make trips to Antarctica in the future. But OK, so what have we really learned? How does, how does this creature uh, survive in Antarctica? Is what we've seen, get rid of that body water, dehydrate. Turn on your heat shock proteins. Turn on your antioxidant responses. OK, elevate the sugars and glycerol a bit. Boost those recycling pathways I talked about and shut down your metabolism. And be an opportunist. I mean, who needs a clock? You don't, you know, you have such a small window of opportunity to uh, do your thing. You're only going to, you're going to be frozen for most of the year. So when it, it, it's the permissible temperatures, keep going. And they just go flat out for that time when they're, uh, they seem to be there. Well, OK, is this simply the you know, esoteric stuff? And I'm using some entomologist who likes to go to Antarctica. Or does it have some other practical consequences? I, I would like to argue, at least in our grant proposal, we argue that there are some other uh, interesting repercussions of this. And the, well, I think one of the big attacks is uh, in the whole area, medically related area, of being able to tissue transplant and that sort of thing. If you had a mechanism like Belgica uses to shut down your metabolism, to dehydrate and still survive in a dehydrated state the way this midge does, it would be a real boon for transplant uh, technology and for uh, use in the medical field. And there's been a lot of interest in uh, at least some interest in, from the medical field, the sorts of results that we, we find from our lessons in Belgica. OK, my final slide, just a uh, 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 shout out to uh, great people, present, um, future, and uh, present and past who worked with, especially I want to highlight Rick Lee, a longtime collaborator from Miami University. Rick and I have collaborated both in temperate region experiments as well as here. And uh, he and his lab have been uh, our work very closely together, people in here. And again, especially uh, grateful for the support from the National Science Foundation Polar Program for allowing us to work there. It's been, been a real privilege. And thank you for coming today. And i uh, be happy to entertain any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. I can cross over to your questions. <laughs> Can you predict the impact that climate change may have on the insect group study? Yeah, I, I wish I wish I could have a better grasp of that. The problem is we don't have really reliable population information from say 25 years ago or so. Now, what is very clear is that the Adeli penguins that we think this they're very important for this midge because of the bacteria they generate. And in fact, it's a bit of a side, but I, I wanted to say when I talked to those penguins, you know, you go to National Geographic pictures of pristine penguins. They look so nice, but I think there should be a scratch and sniff with it. They really stink. It smells like a, a hog farm <laughs> around. But that was, that's a diversion. But anyway, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Adeli penguin numbers are, are way down, and I have to think that that's going to uh, eventually impact the Belgica population too, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, the fact too that they're so, that these populations are so patchy, it's often difficult to get a real good grasp of what the population numbers are. So, but it, clearly the climate change is affecting the penguins, and there are things that we're seeing like, you know, different species, just in the short interval that we've been there, new species of penguins coming in, there are more warm weather penguins, and some of the vegetation is new vegetation coming in that wasn't there in our first years down there. So, no. Yes, I have the two questions. <coughs> first is the Hopan North. Okay. Um, it's restricted to the Antarctic Peninsula, but it, it's not up at the very tip, but you know, down about, uh, um, I'm not sure degree wise where they first appear. Now, uh, but they have been found at scattered locations along the peninsula, and we think that they are probably a relic, representing relic populations. That when the last glaciation, major glaciation occurred, there were probably some pockets that did not glaciate, and that's probably where these midges are found, which accounts for their 
very scattered distribution. We are now actually trying to address that question. I realize that wasn't your question, but we are trying to address that question using a population genetics approach now and looking at Belgica. We're trying to collect Belgica from different, from different areas and see how much genetically separated they are. Much like Galapagos and Darwin and the finches, you know, the finches on different islands uh, became different, speciated into different species. We are suspecting that similar sort of, we'll find a similar sort of thing going on with the Belgica. So we're looking for beak length change. No, we're, we're hoping to, uh, to establish at the genetics level that there might be some interesting changes. But that wasn't your question. Yes. <laughs> Well, they, it takes the, the, the larvae, uh, the larval spans, uh, it takes it two complete years to uh, grow from, hatch from the egg until it's a full grown larva. Then it will uh, spend another uh, winter there. Then the next spring in late December or so, it will pupate and the pupal stage is only about a week uh, most likely. And then the adults emerge but only live a week or 10 days. So we're talking about you know, two, three years. There may be some years, in fact, we have some years, uh, we have some reason to think that in some of the sites where we can find Belgica, some years, you know, it, it never thaws out in those areas. So we suspect that in some cases, they may even not get a chance to feed on one particular year and may have to wait even another year until they have an opportunity to feed. So they really need to be opportunistic uh, creatures and exploit them again. Well, the, that junk DNA really isn't involved in the function of the clock. I mean, this, this, these, the introns and repetitive elements and, and transposons really do not influence the function of the genes. They simply, I mean, most of our bodies, most animals' bodies and plants are, you know, just polluted with all this excess garbage, if you will. I mean, they do have functions, but, but in this case, they've gotten rid of all that stuff. The, the genes are still uh, usually functional. But in the case of the clock genes, though, I can't argue that they are functional in that, and they're certainly not telling time. Now, the clock genes do have other <clears throat> non-clock roles. Some of them are involved in uh, some reproductive events, and two that regulating reproduction. So they, it may be that they've been retained uh, be, for some of these other functions rather than the clock function. We certainly, what I can say with a great deal of confidence is that they're not, they have not maintained their functional clock role. The gene is there, it, when we look at the structure of it, it looks like a perfectly fine clock gene. It should work and all that. And we, the, the fact that it is, ex, the genes are expressed suggests they are, the gene product is being made. It's just not cycling and not involved in timekeeping. So. Yeah. James, uh, how about aquatic insects and uh, in the Antarctic Bay? Has anyone looked into those, like the lake water now has been uh, opened up? Yeah, uh, I don't think there are going to be any insects there. In fact, uh, Belgica, which is really the only, uh, okay, let me say a couple things. There have been, in recent years, um, a couple invading midges from South America that have come over to the very tip of Antarctica. So there are some there, but, Ant but Belgica is the one that has the southernmost distribution, but it would not uh, be in uh, Lake Vostok at, at all. The, uh, there, there could be, uh, I mean, there are plenty of other microbes and other wonderful things that, that are in that lake, but uh, Belgica, definitely not so. And Belgica is definitely restricted to the peninsula. You wouldn't find it at McMurdo or South Pole or any of the other places that some people like to go to. For I, I, I don't understand why they want to go to those places that don't have an insect, but you know, some people apparently do that. <laughs>